Good morning and welcome to the Deeper Bible Study. We are so glad to be here with you today. Hope that you have your Bible and you're ready to study. We got Galatians chapter 6 that we're going to be going through today. We got the wonderful, the awesome, the lovely Michaela Robinson with us this morning. Hi, Michaela. Hey. How you doing? Good. How are you? You look Christmassy over there with your Christmas tree. You know, it's December 2nd, so I thought we'll put a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And... The awesome Mr. Pastor, Zachary Carroll. Are you feeling in the spirit of Christmas? Oh, yes. Yes. I've been feeling in the spirit of Christmas since before Thanksgiving, but it was a sin, apparently, to uh, to do that, so I had to suppress it. Yes, but it's been great. But now we're good. Now we're good. Hey, uh, Michaela, do you have something to encourage our viewers with? I do. I just wanted to encourage you guys to go ahead and like and subscribe um, to our YouTube channel. Um, it's something that you're able to share with others on social media. Um, and it's just something if you are encouraged by this video or by other videos, people can go back and um, watch them. And also if they are looking for something later on, like, oh, let me look for Galatians 6. They can just go on that on YouTube. So it's just a really cool way for us to connect with each other and to share this with others. So. All right. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, uh, we're going to dive into chapter six this morning. Uh, Zach, can you pray for us? And then we're going to read scriptures one through three to start. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to just come together and dive into your word. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit just um, just shows up, God, with us this morning, that you reveal things to us that maybe we would never see on our own. God, we pray that you will just be the center of this study this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, verse 1 through 3 says this, uh, and I'm reading NLT. I know that you got the message, so you may have something a little Mm -hmm. out there. We'll see. Um, (laughs) Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. We're going to get to that. Um, If you think that you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. (laughs) You are not that important. (laughs) I feel like that's a... That's such a, a funny translation, but yeah. I mean, that I, I feel like that when you study it, that is what it's saying. It's like, you're not that important. Mm-hmm. I'm uh, glad that you're reading that translation because mine said that too, and I was like, wow. <laughs> like, t- tell it like it is, okay. <laughs> so, dear brothers and sisters, if, if another believer is overcome by some sin, uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, if you have anything to say on this. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Please interrupt. Uh, but another translation that I was reading uh, said if if a brother or sister is caught in transgression. And uh, specifically, that that word, I, I thought that it was important to kind of examine the difference between what sin and transgression is. Um, the NLT does say some sin, but a sin and transgression are different because a sin, it could be a known or unknown uh, sin. It could be, you know, like... We're all sinners saved by grace. Uh, I think that, you know, we live our life and by our nature, we just sin without even realizing it. But transgression is something, it's a known sin. And so it's like, I know that that's wrong. It's like if you were to tell Asher, uh, because I know he hates putting on shoes, like, Mm -hmm. Asher, put on your shoes, we're about to leave. And Asher tries to walk out the door without his shoes on. It's like, Mm -hmm. dude, I told you, you know better and you still didn't obey. Well, what's interesting uh, is if we're looking at transgression, uh, it's a known sin, and and it and it says to deal with them gently and humbly. Well, isn't that interesting? Because uh, historically, the the church doesn't do a very good job at dealing with those who are sinning, um, especially a known sin, gently and humbly. Uh, I just thought that that was interesting. And it says. Help that person back onto the right path. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think? Um, yeah, I think it was like what I was, I, I was just looking to see if, I, I think it was enduring, enduring word was kind of the cross, um, cross-reference stuff and the tool that I use. But yeah, I was kind of talking about how, um, you know, as believers, we can 
be tempted with kind of our old ways, and we can fall into those old ways. And so as opposed to like, you know, I screwed up today or I messed up today, I did the wrong thing. This was kind of talking about like, I guess a good example would be maybe you were addicted to something and then you're a believer and then you fall into that temptation and, and kind of get drawn back in. I think what I like about this, about gently bringing them back in is um, if you approach that person with condemnation, like mm-hmm. how could you, you know, like it's just, I think that could take it down the really a wrong path. And the I think that it could be really damaging to attack someone's um, mistakes. And so I think this is a very unique situation because um, we're human and I think we can fall into um, some of our old ways at times. And so it's just a, it's a very interesting approach to dealing with this kind of situation particularly because I think we, we do feel a heavier weight when we're like, oh, man, like I was delivered from this or I was saved from this. Mm. And I think that if you start with condemnation and attacking, it could just break that person entirely. And so I think this is a very unique kind of thing. Well, I think there's also something to be said of like, <clears throat> I think there's a reason that it says don't fall into to the same temptation. Like if you were someone yeah. that was a recovering alcoholic or someone that struggled with substance use, and that was something that maybe you haven't been out of that long, it yeah. might not be wise for you to go and to help that person out when they're in the midst of struggling it with it when you're still struggling with it yourself, you know? it might yeah. That might be put you at a more susceptible risk to fall into that temptation. So you have to make sure that you're strong enough in your faith and in your personal life and your own temptations to be able to reach out and extend a hand, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we are dealing with like two two different topics right here because mm-hmm. we're talking about dealing with um, restoring gently and then we're also talking about uh, because the very next scripture talks about don't. Don't uh, be careful not to be tempted by yourself, Uh, meaning like have wisdom in the way that you handle this. Mm -hmm. But real quick, I just want to go back because the the word restore that is used right there, it is a it's a verb that is instructive. And in the Greek, it's katarizo. Uh, I'm sure that I'm not pronouncing that right, but it means to put in order. And so to restore from its former condition, condition. Uh, it was used in secular Greek as a medical term for setting a fractured or dislocated bone. I, I even think about, <clears throat> just because my mind is like kind of racing, uh, I've been watching all these like kid videos late, lately, <laughs> just because my daughter, and I came across this video last night actually, and this doctor was um, giving shots to this baby. And, and, uh, he was like, you know, just playing with the baby, making the baby smile and giggle, even like, you know, with, he had the cap on the needle, mm-hmm. but you know, he's like, uh, poking, poking the baby with the, with the cap on. And the baby was like, ah, 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 ah. and then he took off the cap and was like, Oh, and then doop. <laughs> and like, yeah, and, and, and the baby didn't even know that he got a shot. Mm-hmm. Well, whenever we took our baby for vaccines, the doctor was like, all right, ready? Pop, pop, pop. <laughs> and my daughter was like, ah! And she was freaking out. And like uh, both had to do the same job, but one of them did it gently Mm -hmm. and did it lovingly. Uh, It still required something that was painful, but they did it with love as opposed to, hey, this needs to get done. Like take it, you know, you got what you get, what you get. Like this is what's coming to you. And and I I just thought like um, how do we with love – in truth, because uh, we can't shy away from the truth, right? Uh, but how do we, in love, uh, restore gently those who have been? And 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 uh, one of the one of the things that I was studying said someone that has been caught in transgression, like they're falling into a known sin, and and they're caught in it. Like, uh, and I don't know necessarily if that means like, hey, they got exposed. I mean, we know that uh, all sin will be exposed, um, but how do you deal with them gently? Like we we gotta do, we got we gotta do that, and we gotta we gotta get better at that as as the church, you know. Yeah, I mean, when I looked at this, I saw a couple different examples, but one I think in John was I think three. 
3.17, but, you know, God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save them. So I think yeah, if, yeah. if God didn't send Jesus to condemn, then who are we to condemn? And so you look at, um, you know, the stoning of this woman, where all the religious people at the time were coming together to say, you were wrong, and we're going to stone you. And then Jesus walks on the scene and says, if any of you are without sin, you can throw the first stone. Almost giving them permission to like, yeah, if you're righteous and holy, go ahead. But none of them could. And so I love that um, in this commentary it says, the influence of the legalist among the Galatians made this warning necessary. Nothing reveals the wickedness of legalism better mm. than the way the legalists treat those who have sinned. Yeah, and so, so good. The understanding of grace and forgiveness is far more powerful to lead someone to redemption than the the power of condemnation and judgment. And so, but like you're saying, how do you do this gently? And I think um, it's easy, and I've learned this parenting, and now that you have a child, you learn this parenting as well. But it's so easy to um, to point to your kid and condemn them and judge them for something that's wrong. And then to look at the other approach, sitting them down and talking them through, hey, like, this is why this is wrong. And the fruit of that is so much different because I think as we get down into this, it, it's talking about reaping what you sow. Mm -hmm. And so, one, I feel like the latter is so much more time. Um, it's not as it's not as quick of a result. You feel like you can spank a kid and that's it. But over time, what you see is, man, I've been working on this for six months with my kid and it's like in his nature now that he understands what it means to behave. Um, and so I think we try to get immediate results. I think we try to go to someone and be like, you should never do this again. You know, this is what you were saved from. And, and I don't think that produces the fruit that we want. And so when we're patient and we're gentle and we help people understand and work with them, it may take time. But I think the longevity of that produces way more fruit than just immediately stoning them, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself as Michaela was heading on, um, just being wise in the way that you address that. And I think a lot of times wisdom says to restore with a group of people, um, not a big group, but like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe two or three and uh, holding accountable and mm -hmm. praying for one another and helping restore, um, you know, not one-on-one. -on -one. And so sh having, having some wisdom in the way that we share that. Verse 2 says, share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Isn't that funny? Because uh, Paul has been dealing for the entire book of Galatians primarily with what? Like talking to the church and, and advising them away from the way of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because he's trying, you know, and he talks about it again in the end of this book about circumcision and obeying the law. And he says, he says, sharing each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. There, there's a different law to obey here, the one that's more important that Paul is addressing to the whole church. He goes, obey the law of Christ, not the law um, that, that you uh, have created. And so I just thought that that was interesting. And and the, the implication here is always uh, share each other's burdens, mm -hmm. right? Bear one another's burdens. He doesn't say, hey, expect other people to bear your burdens, because then that would leave us frustrated. Mm -hmm. That would leave us... Um, having expectations that maybe don't get met, but the ideal way is that that we um, would share others' burdens, and because we'll get there, you reap what you sow, uh, you sow to that, then you're going to reap people going, man, let me help bear your burdens as well, and that's the way it's supposed to work, and it's beautiful. Yeah. I don't want to skip over this, but did either of you have anything for you know, the complete Christ law? The what? Like the complete Christ law, like, because, you know, they had Christ law, or, because I, I have the one reference of um, in Galatians 5.14, where it says, the entire law is fulfilled in keeping the one command, love your neighbor as yourself, and even they said, um, when the Pharisees were asking, how do you inherit the kingdom of heaven, or you go through the story, but love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself, so it yeah. seems like love is kind of the essence, but I just, I didn't know what you, um, by sharing their burdens, you complete Christ's law. Would you, oh, yeah, would you yeah. reference that to <clears throat> loving your neighbor? I mean, is that... I don't know if you had anything else other than that, but... No, I mean, I think that that's a good point. Like, yeah. absolutely, it falls right in line with, with what Jesus says is the most important yeah. commands. Um, and 
I like the message for for some reasons, but I love the end of verse three. It just says, "If you think you're too good for that, you are badly deceived," <laughs> which is like so clear. It, and yeah, I mean, he says uh, in in NLT, it says, "You're only fooling yourself. Yeah. You're not that important." And it's <clears throat> one of the one of the things I was reading. It was talking about how the idea here, the idea is not necessarily because because you get deceived, right? It's not necessarily that uh, we we as believers will look and go, oh, well, I'm better than you, so I'm not going to help you. Yeah. But what, what it is, is is it was talking about how your actions will show that you feel I'm more important than you. Yeah. And because I'm more important, then I need to spend my time on me mm-hmm. and not you. Not necessarily that, that we would, you know, because it's deception. It's not clear cut out and open. We would never look yeah. at somebody and go, oh, well, I'm better than you, so I'm not going to help you. We would never do that. But uh, in our actions, and, and a lot of times, well, I, I don't know about you, but I've said this to myself, like, oh, man, I'm just, I'm too busy today. Like, I got to go and do this thing. I, otherwise, I would help. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I would stop. Like, but it's mm-hmm. I'm more important than you, and so my time is more valuable. Yeah. So therefore, I, I can't stop and help you. Well, you make a great point, and that that kind of points me to to Luke ten twenty five. But it's the story of the Good Samaritan, and I think uh-huh. one of the reasons that Jesus was telling this story was because the people that they held at a very high standard were priests and people that worked in the temple. Right. And Jesus kind of tells this story about you know there's this person you know they weren't supposed to be associated with Samaritans, but or, or with um, Jews. There you go. <laughs> and so, but he sees this story of like a priest walks by and is just has too much going on to help this person. And they're like, wait a minute, like the priest is supposed to be the one that does help the people. And then a temple assistant came by, like these are the people that you guys say out of anybody should be helping this person, but they don't. And then you have the Good Samaritan. And I, I think this is kind of holding that... Um, that true to say like don't be too good to to lower yourself down and help these people because yeah. i think in that one story you know the people that and i've probably encountered it too in my in my past where it's like the people that you think would help are like the people that really don't help or wouldn't help and um so i, I like that reference to the story too that even jesus kind of identified that um in that time even the people that they thought would be the ones to help the oppressed really yeah. kind of just skimmed by them. Um, but yeah. Hmm. That's good. Uh, Michaela, can you read verse four through six? Yeah. Um, verse four says, be careful or pay careful attention to your own work for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide their te- should provide for their teachers sharing all the good things with them. Okay, I got a question, and either, either one of you can answer this. But why does he go from talking about uh, bear one another's burdens, um, restore gently? Like he's he's talking about really the the community of of believers right there, and then he goes, "Be careful uh, to pay attention to your own work." So. Uh, then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. You won't need to compare yourself to others, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Why do you think that he yeah. goes from one to the to the other? I don't know. I was wondering that same thing, and I was like, I mean, this is the next verse. It's like saying mm-hmm. the exact opposite almost. Um, but I think even... Like we were just talking about, like sometimes we're so worried about ourselves, um, very like egocentric i guess i remember like in school learning about how babies are egocentric and like Mm -hmm. everything is mine 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 i think even today like as adults we still do that sometimes um but i don't know maybe this is different in a way of like it's not related to like helping people or carrying each other's burdens but it's more like hey don't get caught up in the like comparison game almost okay I don't know. Zach, what do you think? I probably should have looked into it a little bit more because now that you're saying it, I'm <laughs> starting to see like, oh, yeah, I guess it is kind of um, – I, I would be interested to see like who's he talking to, you know, like what's the what's the demographic of people? Church because, of Galatia. Right. And so it's like <laughs> – but what 
because like, you feel like in these letters, like a lot of times they're dealing with specific things. And so like as he's diving into this topic of doing good to all, then you get into four and say, like, what about this sentence would hit home with those people? You know what I mean? Based on maybe what they're going through. So each one of you, so like change the, so now we have a period. Each one of you should test their own actions. You should test your own actions. And so you could take pride in themselves alone without comparing to someone else. And so like something about that was said because it had an importance to what they were going through, right? Well, so just what I studied and it it made a lot of sense is he's saying, hey, love other people. Restore mm-hmm. them gently. Like, don't think of yourself too important. You're not that important. Mm-hmm. And then it's almost like he shifts to going, uh, at the end of the day, you are going to be accountable mm-hmm. to God mm-hmm. for yourself, for the way that you loved others and the way that you represented Christ, um, the way that you lived by the law of Christ. He's going, it's you, your uh, your faith and, and you alone are going to stand um, before God and... Uh, at least that's that's what the the commentary was kind of talking about, and I just thought like so interesting that that shift immediately takes place, and he's just going, "Hey, make sure to to judge yourself." Uh, it, it's almost like uh, whenever we read Matthew seven, where it says, um, "Judge not, lest you be judged." For the way that you judge is the way that you'll be judged. He's going, "Hey, don't be harsh on other people. Don't think yourself more important." Um, actually pay careful attention to your own work. Are you doing what God has called you to do? Um, are you judging yourself as harshly as you're judging other people? Are, are you uh, giving of your life to Christ? And so I just, I thought that, it, that the wording was interesting in the way that it immediately switched. But um, whenever you look at it in that context, it's like, oh, okay, we're, you know, we're looking at Makes sense. This is my relationship with God. Like I, I need to make sure that I'm loving others as He has in, instructed us to do. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I just switched over to Amplified because I think it adds some things to help clarify. But this this translation says, "But each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, examining his actions, attitudes, and behavior, and then he can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. For every person will have to bear with patience his own burden." or faults and shortcomings of which he alone is responsible. So I think what I take from that is like, you know, it says not to be prideful. We can compare to other people and like, look how I'm better than you. But I think this is talking about like, look at your action, your attitude and behavior and find joy in doing something um, and find that that fulfillment from that side of it, like mm-hmm. rather than comparing to other people. So I think it points more inwards, but I, I do like the the way that that's phrased. Yeah. And then it goes into uh, those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. This is like a really awkward verse for like, <laughs> for pastors to, to like preach on. Because I mean, and, and I, I think that it's interesting too, it says sharing. Mm-hmm. all good things with them, not like, hey, uh, pay them, you know, for, for their work. But it's like, hey, share all good things with them. Like, make sure that those who you are learning from or that you're, you're uh, you know, you're receiving teaching of the Word of God, make sure that they don't go without. Like, you want to make sure and take care of them. And, uh, yeah, this was always easier to talk about whenever I wasn't the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, verse 7. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. There we go with that reaping and sowing, right? Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Mm. I mean, this is like the biblical principle, I think, that uh, is is probably to some degree or another preached every single week, right? Like uh, you reap what you sow. Uh, don't sow to your sinful nature, but sow to the Spirit and and walk in the Spirit. I mean, you can literally preach on this this passage right here to some degree every week and never get tired of it because Mm -hmm. it's intertwined in everything that we talk about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think it's like, it can be challenging at the same time because 
and this might this might take it deeper. Do Did it. You catch that? Yeah, oh yeah. Got it. I th- what I find, and this is going to be um, that might be challenging to hear, but what I find is. Is and I love in verse ten. Therefore, we have an opportunity. Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. In today's world, what I see a lot of is um, is this idea of reaping what we sow. There's so much conflict and there's so much division, even amongst God's people. We can take a political source and we can divide our friend group. We can take a stance on something and. I think that the more we look at the kingdom, the more we look, like, that is such a, I mean, I'm just going to be honest, like, that is such a fleshly thing to do, is to defend what I believe, what my opinion is, and I think it's so important that we go to the Bible and the Word of God to defend what the Spirit's desire is for people, because, um, you know, and I love what Frank Turret came and said that, look at the state of our country and how Christians don't speak up, but if Christians are speaking up on behalf of their own fleshly desires and what they believe is justice or whatever, and we don't go to the Word, um, it's not doing exactly what we were called to do. And so I- I've been challenged with this too, is because I, I think I-, I grow up and I'm taught something and I'm raised to believe something, and then I, and then I look at the Bible or-, or God or the Spirit's desire, and I go, is it worth saying that? Like, is is me defending what I believe um, going in hand and foot with what the Spirit wants or what God wants. And so I, I just think that like it's a really challenging thing that we can kind of work on as believers as well is because it's like you do you are going to reap what you sow. And um, I, I just, I've seen this so much in the last year that it, it actually kind of is heart-wrenching at times because it's like, man, um, deep down inside – there's there's a lot of conflict and and things going on, but I think that the more we filter it through this concept of like, can I can I ask everyone to say like before I ever say anything like what would the spirit have me say or what does God desire of me? Um, it would be interesting to see the the fruit of that because I just feel like as and maybe you guys can speak to this too, but as believers as Christians, I think now more than ever the world can look inward to the church and its people. And see that in a lot of ways we can be so divided on things that, um, you know, I feel like if we filter it through what God wants, maybe they would bring some clarity. And I know that was kind of deep, but that's just like my own personal conviction right now is like I don't I don't want to start anything with people that's going to cause division because I don't think ultimately that's what God wants us to do and that's what the Spirit um, wants us to do. And so I don't know. What do you guys? I think uh, Michael DeRemer uh, is someone who goes to our church, and he always gives me this advice. He says, Josh, you got to do LSD. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> he said, let the spirit direct. <laughs> so yeah. he always tells me, let the spirit direct. And, and uh, I mean, honestly, like, if, if we were to let the spirit direct in all that we do, mm-hmm. then we would know uh, what things to take on, what, you know, because I, I think that we look at, we look at, uh, conflict and mm-hmm. we go risk reward you know what i yeah. mean uh is this worth diving into am i gonna am i gonna win you over by arguing with you about my political stance probably not yeah. um how did we come to to faith like why why do we love christ yeah right the bible says we love because he first loved us mm-hmm. and if we're letting the spirit direct it's it's pretty rare I, I would I would expect that the spirit is going to lead us to get into an argument over something as trivial as as politics. Um, we're not going to win somebody that way. Uh, typically, uh, with the things that are the most controversial right now, people are set in their ways, and the only way that they will be won over is by love. Um, the love of Christ is is the reason that we love because He first loved us. Now there are things that we need to take a stand for, uh, regardless. Like we need to take a stand for things that are biblical. And so I know that uh, just the other yesterday, I think um, they were uh, the, taking to the Supreme Court the issue of uh, abortion and uh, you know the heartbeat uh, thing and and like we need to take a stand for life. Like, yeah, yeah people are not going to like that. It's uncomfortable. Some people have really strong opinions that are on the opposite side of the aisle for that. But I mean, mm-hmm. if, if this is biblical, I mean, if this is going to cause persecution, let it cause persecution because, uh, 
I mean, we read in, in the book of Proverbs on Sunday, the, the things that the Lord hates, the shedding of innocent blood. And so when it comes to some things like that, we can't be ashamed to, to yeah. stand up and, and, and fight for what we believe the Word of God tells us to fight for. And so uh, with that issue or, or the biblical issues, yeah, we're going to stand up and have conflict. And I believe that the Spirit will, will uh, lead us to do that. Um, but on other issues, it's going. Hey, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna jump into conflict with you. I'm gonna let the spirit direct. Mm-hmm. And if I can win you with love, then I'm gonna do that. And so, uh, yeah. I mean, walking in the spirit is something that we could we could do a year long series on and not even touch it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just so vital as believers. If we're not walking in spirit, if we're not asking in prayer, Lord, what do you have for me? Um, then we're we're missing it totally. And so. Well, and, you know, tying it back to, you know, verse 1, verse 2, and how we can fall into temptation and sin, like, I always try to imagine kind of these two coexisting things inside of me, which is my flesh and my spirit, and, you know, reading the Word daily and prayer daily, like, whichever one of those I'm, I'm going to feed is whichever one's going to take over, and so it's like... um that's always been a good representation for me to remember is that like, especially as a new believer, like my spirit is very, very weak and it, and it takes a long time to lean into the spirit of God and to, to kind of put away your selfish desires. But I feel like in a lot of ways, like, and, and maybe this is something that you can explore. And, um, I know as growing up in church, it's, it's come at different seasons and probably now as I'm older than I've ever been more than ever, but like, Letting God, we can all say that every God day. <laughs> speak to you in ways that you would have never imagined. You know, it's like how often do we look at people just passing by and, and make these judgments? And it's like pray to God to help you change in that because I think we can give Him different areas of our lives. And so, like, there's areas where it's like I'm good in this regard and I'm a Christian in this regard, but in this side, I'm still very much flesh and I'm still very much yeah. like judgmental and like the more we give to god like he says imagine that being you're sowing you're gonna reap that stuff in your life and so yeah. we can kind of excuse a lot of different areas but i think the more we like this examine ourselves find yeah. fault within ourselves those are the areas that we can work on and kind of grow in this i'm gonna i'm gonna do something a little bit crazy right now because oh man uh what we're what we're getting to is the very end of this, and Paul even says in verse eleven he says, "Notice what large letters I use as I write these closing words in my handwriting." Uh, I know that we're we're short on time, but I'm going to finish right now because Paul is wrapping up what he's been saying for the entire entire time, and so I want to highlight two things that he says in these last uh, couple of verses. He says, "As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of that cross." My interest in this world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. Oh, man. Like, (laughs) what a statement. My interest in the world, the ways of the world, the things of the flesh, it it has been crucified to that cross. And because of that, the world, uh, my interest in the world, and he says, and the world's interest in me has also died, which is also going to lead itself to persecution, all of that kind of stuff. I just think that that is such a... Uh, beautiful way that he says that. And then in the end, he says, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live um, by this principle. They are the new people of God from now on. Don't let anyone trouble me with these things. He says, I'm done. I've said it as plainly as I can. I've used as big a letters as possible. I've, I've said it over and over, and, and he's almost like, okay, I'm done with this. Don't bother me with these things again. He says, from now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that now show I belong to Jesus. I do not belong to the law of Moses. I do not belong to the religious law of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Don't bother me with it anymore. Uh, I, I can't boast in anything but the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's the message that you kind of see uh, continue throughout all of Paul's letters over and over. He's battling this uh, consistent religious spirit that is trying to attack the church, that he's sharing the the what Jesus has done. He's going, it's Jesus and nothing else. It's faith in Jesus plus nothing. 
That's what saves you, not because of anything that you could do. And that's that's a, what an incredible conclusion that Paul leaves us here with at the very end of Galatians chapter 6. And, and I, I just love the heart on it. He goes, don't bother me with the stuff anymore. I've written it <laughs> as plainly as I can. This is it. And and you can go back and and start in in uh, chapter one if you'd like you know right. like, like read it again because this is it I don't have anything else to say on it yeah so uh, with that we are concluding Galatians yeah. and what does that mean for next week Michaela tell the viewers um, I believe that means that we are actually going to be taking a break yes um, probably for. I don't know. The rest of I, December. The rest of December. And we're we'll gonna come back we're gonna start afresh. Yep, we're gonna start fresh in the new year, um, and we will uh, share with you what we're going to be studying soon. Um, but we haven't made that decision uh, for sure yet. So mm -hmm. stay tuned. We're really excited to continue studying this, but we want you and us. We're gonna enjoy this season celebration of the birth of our Savior, all about Jesus. So thank you guys for joining us. Pray you have a blessed, wonderful day. We'll be right back here Sunday at 9 a.m. Have a good day.